All right, if we would be taking our seats, we're going to go ahead and restart our presentation. All those little technological gremlins, you got to love them. And uh, anyway, this is my beloved son, Jared Cressman. He's my oldest son. I have two sons. My oldest son is Jared. My good son is in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> and he's never heard that before, so you know. But, uh, it's no longer funny for me, but I'm glad you guys enjoy it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he, uh, he's kind of a mini-me in theology, I guess. And uh, the Lord called him a long time ago to uh, something that I don't... I mean, I dabble with, but I don't necessarily feel called to it. It's deliverance ministry, and that has been interesting. So, uh, with no further ado, I give you Jared Crespin. Well, I gave my a little bit of my testimony last night to the group that was here for the meet and greet. Um, don't have a lot of time to get into why I do what I do today with the people that I do it with, but... Um, Pretty much, uh, I have a fascination with everything that we've talked about today. I love the subject of the Nephilim. I love the subject of the sons of God. You know, the Bible came alive when I started realizing how much deeper the scriptures went. And largely in part, I've learned a lot from people like Rob and Judd and Aaron over the years with the paths that they've taken in their own research. And so, you know, part of my understanding uh, in the deliverance ministry has been deepened and furthered by the research that these men that I get to share the stage with today have been actively a part of. And I'm incredibly blessed to be able to call these men friends uh, to this day. And, uh, you know, it, uh, I don't know, it just warms my heart when we all get to be in the same place and talk about the things that we love. Now, my specialty is a little different. I don't study bones. I'm not an archaeologist. I don't get to play Indiana Jones. Uh, what I do is the deliverance ministry. Play. Huh? Play, play with bones. <laughs> I think Judd takes offense to that, but I think he's just a big kid with a shovel. Um, but anyway, what I do is deliverance ministry. How I got into that, that's a long story, story for another day. But let me just fast track. You know, you get into deliverance ministry, it becomes a serious part. You start helping people. You're going to run into something called satanic ritual abuse. It's something that is, as far as I'm concerned, as dark as deliverance ministry gets. It's as weird and complex as the deliverance ministry gets. And it opens up rabbit holes and enemies in all directions. And so one of the things that I did here recently with a buddy of mine, Tom Dunn, was we did a movie called Detestable. It's a documentary about satanic ritual abuse. And it follows the lives and stories of several people that actually survived satanic ritual abuse. Something that I tell people when I speak is that whenever I speak about deliverance or some of our experiences or stories or even share the stories that others have, have told us in, um, in counseling sessions. When we try to retell those stories from the survivors, it very rarely ever comes close to how powerful the story is from the victim that survived it. The first-hand accounts of satanic ritual abuse survivors, they have stories that will just rock your world. I, I mean, I've been in tears countless times just sitting across the table from somebody that became emotionally distraught and overcome with reliving the experiences as they told them. And Tom and I, uh, Tom is, Tom Dunn, he lives in Ohio. He works uh, with Russ Dizdar a lot and Russ Dizdar's team. Uh, I have the privilege of calling Russ a friend. And on several occasions when I've been in over my head, I, uh, Russ has counseled me through some stuff, uh, you know, dealing with some deliverance situations. And so uh, on that, uh, there's a huge blessing there, having access to pretty much what I would consider the best, you know, in the field right now. And Tom and I, we, we use some of our contacts and our resources, and we decided to put... Um, satanic ritual abuse survivors in front of a camera and uh, get their stories. We wanted to put some experts that had been in the field that were credible and we wanted to put them on camera too to corroborate those stories. And so that's what we did. Nine months of, of really laborious work and you know the finished product is detestable. And um, I forgot to bring a copy of it up here to show you but uh, it was released about a month ago. It's on Vimeo. It's available for rent and purchase digitally. Um, go ahead and bring that up here Kevin if you don't mind. And uh, anyway, it's just something I'm very proud to be a part of because so far it's been getting very good reviews. It's mostly been circulating in the Christian culture. Uh, I'm pretty sure as soon as the secular world picks it up, we're going to get hit with the same stuff the secular world has always thrown at this topic. And pretty much my attempt today is to just take the movie, which I could talk about for two hours, and 
deliverance ministry, which I could talk about for a day at least, uh, and tie it in to the subject of this conference, which is the Sons of God and the Watchers, Giants of Old, you'll find that the more that you study both of these subjects, they're intricately connected. And today, as we study the aspects of the giants and the possible return, whether or not you believe in the return of the Nephilim, that's beside the point. We all, most of us in this room agree that they existed and that there were supernatural powers that were way beyond our average comprehension that were behind the creation of those. And what we see in this world today is that those supernatural entities that were at the forefront of that are still working in the society, bringing about an end, you know, a, a means to an end that is been foretold in prophecy you know we've, we've got this constant cosmic chess match that Marzulli talks about this is an integral piece of that cosmic chess match that most people don't know anything about um, when I talk about satanic ritual abuse I'm not talking about sensational forms of Satanism uh, I'm not talking about Anton LaVey I'm not talking about sometimes Michael Aquino but the pop culture version of Satanism is not what I'm talking about it's my belief that there is an underlying spirit that is in control in high places, like Ephesians 6 tells us, we were not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in high places. Um, I believe that there is something that is lurking behind the scenes that goes way beyond the pop culture interpretations of such. There's something so evil, so pervasive, so dark and so sinister in, in, in control in many respects uh, that it operates on a level that most of us can't comprehend. And as we sit in our chairs and we watch TV and we're programmed every day by the, corp you know, the, the, the mass you know, corporately owned media trying to force feed us information and you know, modify our, our behavior and our mindset, we don't clue in to the reality of the occult that's working behind the scenes in a Luciferian agenda. And so what I want to do today is I'm, I'm talking to the church. I'm not talking to the secular world. I know this is going on YouTube. You know, I don't care if people are naysayers about this subject. What I want people to take away from this is that there's a biblical foundation for what we're dealing with today. And even if we don't get to talk about everything that's going on today, understand that there's a very strong premise. And it makes everything that's happening today that I'm going to tie it into very plausible. So this secret power that's moving behind the scenes... Uh, you know, the scripture referred to as the mystery of iniquity. It's the secret power of lawlessness. 2 Thessalonians 2.7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Satanists that tattoo 666 on their forehead. I'm not talking about uh, black metal rocking, you know, wannabes that, you know, have pentagrams on their arm that really have no comprehension. I'm talking about a form of sacrifice. I'm, I'm talking about a, a form of belief that goes all the way back into ancient antiquity. Something that was given to us very early in the history of men uh, that most people don't have any comprehension of. It's something that is very prevalent to this day. Uh, this is our scripture verse that we used for our movie. It was one that we posted in lots of places. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will still see greater abominations. That was Ezekiel 8.6. Um, if you read the story of Ezekiel in chapter 8, you'll find that Ezekiel is taken by this angel of the Lord into the temple, and he is shown the abominations that's taking place by the elders. They're doing horribly detestable things inside the temple, inside the holy place. And even here, you have this is something that's always stuck out in my mind, and I've used it many times. Uh, do you, uh, to drive me far from my sanctuary. Here you have men that are operating inside God's house that are performing rituals and detestable acts, and they are, they are intentionally trying to force the Holy Spirit from his territory. It's always a turf war in the Scripture when it comes to the occult powers in God. Always a turf war. We're still living in that turf war. There's a competition for territory. And if you look at the state of America right now, nobody can beat God. Nobody can beat God. God has all the authority. But there are times where he allows himself to be removed for a time, and we get what we ask for if we support it. And right now, it appears to me that our nation, by far and large, is definitely supporting you know, the antithesis of what God has established. We're supporting these alternative powers and principalities in high places. We're told to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Ephesians 5, 11 through 13. This is why we did the movie. 
Because we are acutely aware that there is an evil that most people don't comprehend, and we seek to expose it. The Lord opened doors, and we, sent, we, we, we intend to cast light in the darkest of areas as far as this research is concerned. And we are really hoping it makes its way into the churches, not for the sake of selling copies of this DVD, but for getting the information out there. Christians don't engage in spiritual warfare hardly anymore. They don't even know how. They don't even understand the danger that they're in. If they don't understand the danger the church is in today, why would we pray against it? So the goal of this movie is speaking to the church to wake, Tom says, it's a screaming wake-up call to the body of Christ. Wake up. You know, we want the church to understand that this is a reality. We want people to be praying, if nothing else, against these powers and principalities. Um, to further elaborate on the type of Satanism I'm talking about and what comes after this, I'm going to go ahead and play a clip from our movie, uh, and I'm going to let Russ do it. Go ahead, Carl. Father, bless everyone. Please, 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 Many of you this evening do not know uh, what we've uncovered in the last 35 years. And it hasn't gone away. It is not, um, it is not subsiding. It is not a fad over, you know, just a period of time. It is the sequence of satanic evolution. And there is an agenda so vast so wide, so broad, so strong, that God began to reveal and give insight to it 2,600 years ago in the book of Daniel. I think everybody's heard about Satanism. If anybody, you know, you go back to the 60s even, uh, a lot of album covers came out and pentagrams and stuff about Satan. The Satanic Bible was written, I believe, and put out by Anton LaVey, the Church of Satan in California. Uh, that was, I think, 1969. And that was, um, I mean, even though they were claiming that they didn't believe in a real Satan but satanic principles, uh, the nine statements, um, they, that was, a, again, a popular, we call that, I call that popular Satanism. Uh, because you can join for $25, you can become a member and, and uh, go to rituals and, and so forth. So that's popular Satanism, but old traditional Satanism was like the Cathedral of the Black Goat in, in Los Angeles. These are people that uh, like have the Devil's Bible. They believe in Satan. They believe in rituals. They believe in uh, shedding blood. They have in that book how to do, uh, how to renounce God, Christ, how to do desecration to a Bible. While you're surrendering yourself to Satan, you're going to worship Satan, and you're never going to get out. So that's the real old line traditional Satanism kind of um, goes back to uh, European uh, Satanism with the hoods, the black hoods, uh, Latin backwards, things like that. But underneath all of that, and we could talk about psycho-Satanism, Richard Ramirez, the, the Night Stalker, uh, individual people that got into Satanism on their own, they may have gotten demonized, and then they go out and commit horrific acts and things like that. So we would call that criminal, psycho, or self-oriented uh, Satanism too. But then underneath all of that is something darker and we would say generational, but it's generational in my view in the sense of uh, uh, thousands of years. Now we would track what we're talking about here. First of all, I call them the real Luciferians. They would call themselves under the Nazi terminology, the black flame, the order or the ancient brotherhood. Now these are individuals that have um, really yielded the dark side. Uh, they remind me of those in Daniel, the astrologers, sorcerers, the Chaldeans. I mean, they were really, really knowledgeable about rituals, knowledgeable about all of it. And they were clearly into human sacrifice, blood sacrifice. So when we begin to deal with this, um, and this is related to the, sa the satanic ritual abuse where they split personality, demonize, and program, this kind I would still call the real Luciferian uh, where they create what they call chosen ones, satanic chosen ones. Uh, they're going to be ones that will, um, and they believe whether we do or not to be the troops of Antichrist, things like this. Now, when we began to deal with this, it was one thing of dealing with the victims and helping them and, and working with them, but the big issue was why are there so many of them? And why are they in every city? Why are they in every state? 
And then eventually, we can talk about this later, uh, why are they in multiple continents and nations all around the world? Why are there 40 million of them? And so the tracking showed this is a huge development. And in our tracking, it goes back ultimately to the Nazis, uh, the, the darkest side of them, Himmler and the rest of them, the Vadelsberg Castle where they were going to rule the world from. This is the belief, spiritually given, demonically given, uh, that there's going to be, they're going to create a master race. That they would be able to take Germans who had Aryan, their occult version of the Aryan, was they were godmen. Uh, they were what we would say the old Nephilim, a Nephilim tribe. They were the giants. These were uh, bigger, taller, stronger humans. And so in history, um, World War II, they were actually going to create tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these troops that would help not only conquer the world, but then to rule the world for a thousand year Reich. And this was the German belief based on spiritual revelation we would say satanic or demonic, and they really believed that. And so they began to uh, take those Germans that could prove the occult Aryan bloodline, and they would make them breed so that they can produce an Aryan, an occult-oriented, a power uh, that have the dark powers in the DNA. Uh, they, wanted to be, they wanted to create uh, another generation, they would be the god men. Notice the term god men, hybrids. And then they would keep doing this breeding project to where they can backbreed to, to, to bring about these taller, stronger um, god men, uh, master race that could have powers that came straight out of their DNA telekinesis, clairvoyance, uh, psi powers, um, and so forth. Now, they also started secretly a project called Lebensborn. All over Germany and even outside of Germany, they began to do this breeding. Some say up to 900,000 babies were born between 1938, 1939, into the 1941-42. Um, and, and that's where modern-day satanic ritual abuse, the, the phenomenon we see today, that's where it started. That's... Now, again, we can hop backwards, though, on a spiritual sense. We can go all the way back to Ezekiel chapter 8. The underground Luciferic, uh, the serpent worship, human sacrifice, it's very, it's very similar. Um, and I would, I would say it is generational. So the sense of satanic um, generational development on the earth since the fall of the human race, even after the flood, we have this project of uh, war against God, war against the people of God. So Israel is constantly attacked. Um, eventually the church would be engaged. But there is a bigger and broader uh, project, I believe, that the satanic side, and we, we, I love to use the word, the musterium, the mystery of iniquity, the secret power of lawlessness. This is the uh, global system of, of the fallen ones, as they're entrenched into humans, and as they begin to embed this global, you know, dream of uh, a regime change, bring down all the nations, bring a new global order, you can't do that without the troops. You cannot um, do that at all. Uh, you can't have a new world order without uh, the most superior military troops in history. So that's the goal, ultimately, of this. You can't have a new world order unless you have superior troops. <laughs> it kind of dovetails nicely with Rob Skiba's presentation. When you look at the stuff Rob was talking about, look who was 60, 70 years ahead. I mean, the Nazis were trying to bring this to fruition back in the 40s. I mean, this is not a new concept. And they, it wasn't even a new concept then, you know? This is a concept that started all the way back where Rob and Judd and Aaron are talking about. This is not something new. This is all intricately tied together. Now, on the subject of modern satanic ritual abuse, you know, we kind of, the, the whole modern side to satanic ritual abuse, the contemporary version that we know, the, tying into this mystery of iniquity, goes back as far as I'm concerned to the Nazis. That's where my research always goes, you know, right back to the Nazis. Operation Paperclip, we incorporated like, what, 5,000 Nazi scientists into the, to military bases everywhere, gave all of them some form of anonymity and you know, discarded all the charges, and then we took their occultic sciences and made them primary research projects in the United States, 
And then we wonder why we have people in the 50s that start popping up with subpersonalities. This is something that came directly from the Nazis. If you research the Nazi, Hitler, Himmler, Hitler and Himmler. You, the, you had this castle that Himmler signed a lease on for a thousand years. They built this octagon inside. It had this picture of a black sun on the floor where they did sacrifices. You know, Hitler slept with a copy of The Secret Doctrines, which was written by Helena P. Blavatsky, on his bedside. And when you read the writings of Helena P. Blavatsky, which I don't recommend, you'll find my occultic books, I, I sign my name and I authoritatively say they're for research only, demons not allowed, pretty much. And I sign my name to them because it's important for me to read some of them, but I understand the power that's behind them. So I don't allow that kind of stuff into my house without praying over it. Uh, but anyway, Helena P. Blavatsky writes about the Archons, you know, channeling the knowledge of the Archons. You know, where does this stuff come from? It, it dies off for a while, but it always comes back. Why? Because there's a mystery of iniquity, secret power of lawlessness that's working. This is, this is this metaphysical global system of control that operates on a level way above the average man. So when we're talking about human sacrifice, you know, I always, in everything that I do, I always want to start back in the scripture. What does the Bible have to say about it? Well, today when you talk about human sacrifice, you're met with the fury of the secular world telling us that these are concocted memories. It doesn't matter if 100,000 people this year came out and said that they had some form of ritual abuse in their lifetime. It doesn't matter. They had some form of trauma, they'll tell you, that then they filled in all the gaps and added sensational satanic components. You know, you got the false memory syndrome foundation that was created for the sole and specific reason of literally crushing the testimonies of those that came forth and had a satanic ritual abuse experience. You know, why? Why are they creating these organizations? Well, let's just see if in the scripture there's any premise for human sacrifice in antiquity. So, what do the scriptures have to say about human sacrifice? Well, I'm only bringing a few of them because you can exhaust a day reading the scriptures on this topic. But in Leviticus, we're told that you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech. Well, it stands to reason. I mean, I would think I'm applying... I think my conclusion that human sacrifice was taking place is, is logical, given that God is telling people not to. I imagine he's telling people not to because there are people that are. Okay? So let's read a little further. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Well, now we just got a little more detail. Not only are we being told just not to offer them to Molech, uh, we're being given a description that they that we had we had people being sacrificed to the demons. Innocent blood was poured out, blood of the sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. Well, I don't think there's any arguing that, that speaks of human sacrifice, do you? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Deuteronomy 12, 31. Human sacrifice. And he, Ahaz, made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burned his sons as an offering according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Not only did he just sacrifice and make offerings on high places, but he did so on the hills and he did so under every green tree. This was not a casual happenstance. Oh, I think I will sacrifice somebody today. This is a guy that killed a lot of people. They had slaughtered a lot of people in the name of his God. Second Chronicles 28. It doesn't just happen on altars, man. And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom. I, I, I think I'm saying that right. If I'm not, forgive me. And used fortune telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. I, I think this is speaking about Manasseh. Uh, forgive me if it's not. Second Chronicles 33, 6. Okay, so um, this valley of Hinnom came up several times, son of Hinnom. So as I was reading these scripture verses, trying to figure out which ones to use, I just recently read a book by Michael Heiser called Unseen Realm, which is a fantastic book. I cannot recommend it enough. As far as, you know, 
uh, scholarly ability. Michael Heiser is second to none as far as I'm concerned when it comes to his knowledge of Hebrew. We're going to differ on some opinions, but I really respect that guy in some of the work that he's done. And so I value his opinion, and I put it in this presentation. In, in Hebrew, his, in, these are his words, a direct, I'm going to pull this from his book, Valley of Hinnom is Gehenna, which I think my dad just said, a phrase from which the name Gehenna derives. In New Testament times, Gehenna had become a designation for the very fiery realm of the dead, hell, or Hades. The history of the Valley of Hinnom, no doubt, was part of the reason for this conception. The translated meaning of Gehenna in Hebrew is most likely Valley of Wailing, an understandable description given the child sacrifice that took place there. So when you pursue academically looking further into the scriptures, this is something that you find, right? Some of these subtle things pop out, adding further credence to the fact that, hey, people were dying and in masses. That was on page 229. Uh, these sacrifices took place at ritual centers called Topheth, a burning place, according to Heiser. And later, Valley of Hinnom became referred to as the place of Tophet. Uh, so why? You know, those are just a few scriptures. I mean, for the sake of time, I wish we could go into more. There are plenty of better stories, too. But why? Where did it come from? You know, why in modern satanic ritual abuse do we deal with human sacrifice? What Russ was talking about. You know, why... Back then, did we have men, you know, where did that come from? Where was, where was the first idea to sacrifice someone to a deity? I don't know that I have the answer to that, but I think we have some clues in Enoch 8. Rob already kind of brought this up. He beat me to it. I guess it's his idea. I guess I got to give up. That's an inside joke. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. So here we have the basic premise of war and bloodshed. I mean, you know, at this point, I mean, people had already died. I mean, I'm not saying that he taught death. I mean, death was something that was instituted, obviously, at the fall. And yet, you know, Cain killed Abel. But... There's something here that's being taught outside of just death. You know, there's, a, there's strategy to death that's being taught here. The fine, refining the art of death, so to speak, in my opinion. Here you have a man that is teaching you how to kill. Well, a man, I'm sorry, son of God. You know, you get the, the, one of the watchers. Um, Azazel, which coincidentally, when you read later on, so, small point, all blame is ascribed to Azazel. None of the other watchers took the same penalty that Azazel did. And you will find Azazel mentioned in the Old Testament as the scapegoat and the one that the priest would lay hands on, symbolizing putting the sins on him and sending him out into the desert, you know, which is also another interesting point on why they did that. But um, here we have the refining touches on death and bloodshed, warfare, which I also submit to you that a ritual human sacrifice is, is waging war, warfare on God Almighty. Um, Semyaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Well, gee, that sounds appropriate, right? You know, I mean, how many of you just pick up enchantments and root cuttings, you know, without even thinking twice about it? No, I mean, that has some negative connotation there. Um, they taught the resolving of enchantments. Astrology, constellations, knowledge of the clouds, signs of the earth, the signs of the sun, course of the moon. We just read in a passage where he was consulting with astrologers and necromancers. Necromancy, as far as I'm concerned, is, is probably as dark and gritty and disgusting as it gets, and I don't recommend anybody studies it. But what's interesting is a lot of necromancers do things according to the signs in the, in the heavens. You know, when you really get into the magic that's being taken place today, you'll find that there's a huge, there's a huge value placed on the alignment of the stars and the heavens and the times and the dates. For instance, a man that was in her film, Dr. Gregory Reed, which I've never met in the flesh, but I highly respect, and I've come to call him a friend. Um, his whole involvement when he, got, when he got sucked into this occultic thing, I think when he was around nine years old, was all because he was born on February the 15th, which was uh, the date of the feast of the Roman god Lupercus. The, the group that he ended up getting tied in with was a weird mix, eclectic mix of black magic and druidism. They placed a lot of... They placed a lot of uh, a weight with, uh, with with that with those gods, and so being born on February fifteenth, you know, the you were you were prime for, for being ushered through that system, both ritualized and 
most of the time later on given a position of authority in the in the occult. Excuse me. So anyway, here we go. We have some big clues here. I mean, other than this, I don't know exactly what the Watchers taught, but as far as I'm concerned, they taught men the foundation of occultic bloodshed and the knowledge and tools that we use now uh, to engage in ritual magic. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. So here I'm going to make the point and I submit to you that one of the reasons why in antiquity people were sacrificing is because they were worshipping other gods that actually had authority over the land in which they lived. See, we live in a Christian culture today that likes to tell us that Satan's got no power over me. There's no way any, there's no way any demonic power or principality could touch me or my family. I'm spirit-filled. Well, that's great. I don't believe a Christian can be possessed. But I do believe they can be oppressed, and I believe that in certain cases... And I, I do stress this. I believe there are, different, there are different levels of demonization. And I believe it's even possible for a Christian to be demonized to an extent. Okay, I don't want to get lambasted in comments. But I've been here, done that, and I've had to ask a lot of questions sitting across the table sometimes. And this is where I've come to. I reserve the right to be wrong. So here we have this scripture verse. God fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Well, why would he divide the nations up according to the number of the sons of God? Well, when you dig into it, you find that this is where God disinherited the nations. He says, you don't want me to be your God? Fine, I will remove myself and I will put other gods over you. See how you like that. That's exactly what he did. Michael Heiser backs that up. As odd as it sounds, the rest of the nations were placed under the authority of members of Yahweh's divine council. The other nations were assigned to lesser Elohim as a judgment from the Most High Yahweh. And what you see in these cultures and civilizations is the very foundation of what they taught in Enoch chapter 8 is what they started requiring of the ones that they ruled over. You even see later on in Psalms where you have, is it Psalms 83? Is it Psalms 82 or 83 where ye will die like men? Right? Where he's referring to the divine council? 82. 82. Talks about it being corrupt. He rails against him as corrupt and says, you will die like men. He is talking to these lowercase g gods, the Elohim. They ruled people. And the fact is, you know, I don't know how many. I've got questions. This has opened up a can of worms that I haven't been able to answer. As far as the number, some of the sons of God, they were imprisoned. You know, here we have more sons of God that take authority. Obviously, you know, they're corrupt. We see what they require. I'm not sure exactly how many there are. 200 descended on Mount Hermon, according to Enoch. Here we have 70 that seems like they take control. Later on in Luke, Jesus sends out the 70, right, to go forth. As, as he sends them out into the world and gives them authority to cast out demons and such, why 70? 70 or 72, I think there's a discrepancy on that. I don't care. Why? Why that number? Because I believe that number directly correlates to the number back in Deuteronomy 32 where God disinherited those nations. So we, we advance from biblical times a little bit. And we'll say, okay, maybe it was an isolated incident. Maybe this was just, maybe the human sacrifice in the Bible is where it stopped. It's never happened again. Well, crack a textbook. Because all you have to do is get on Wikipedia and type in, yeah, I'm not a Wikipedia fan. I mean, it's not like the be-all, end-all of, of knowledge. And I don't trust a lot of stuff on there. But for this case, all you have to do is type in human sacrifice, right? Type in human sacrifice. And I mean, it is menus and submenus of the history of human sacrifice uh, on earth, right? So... Let's look at some of the places. Ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Levant, which coincidentally we've already talked about some of those from biblical times. The Phoenicians, uh, Neolithic Europe, Greco-Roman antiquity, the Celts, Germanic peoples, Slavic peoples, China, Tibet, India, Hawaii, Maya, Aztec, South America, West Africa, the Canary Islands. It, it, just, it just goes on and on. When you look back in history, there is a never-ending lineup of, of, of like... Finding sites where people were, had their skulls bashed in on an altar or their heart cut out or whatever. You know, the Mayans were big about that. Uh, the Aztecs were big about that. Sacrificing the Quetzalcoatl or, you know, whatever. Um, it's just, it's always in China. It was to the, some of them was to the river deities. And, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just endless. It's just endless. There's just been bloodshed ever since the beginning in, in the name of other gods. You know, human sacrifice was so prevalent in Scripture as well as virtually every other culture over the last 2,000 years. Why do so many Christians casually dismiss the notion that human sacrifice could be happening in our nation? Or even our state, our city, our town, our neighborhoods? And I, and I hate to be this sensational, 
but even the house next door. Why is that so off limits when the, entire, the history of mankind is riddled on the blood of human sacrifice to other deities? Why is it all of a sudden off limits in the United States or wherever in, in, in the world? This is something that perplexes me, okay? When I start to contemplate the possibility, I have just, I, the only thing I've done here is I've taken the statistics that the National Center for Exploited and Missing Children provides. But I have not done this math myself. And I have questions about this math. I have tried to find some answers. You'll find that missing person statistics are some of the most convoluted statistics on the planet. But here, uh, the FBI, you'll know the NCIC. You want to talk about the NCIC? That's the FBI database that these entries are put into. According to the FBI in 2015, there were 460,699 NCIC entries for missing children. Now, it's important to note that anytime you have a child that runs away, he is going to be added that instance that he ran away into the database. So you can have a child that's listed 10 times in this number, okay? So once again, we have some mystery in this number. How many kids actually went missing? You know, certainly you have runaways, but how many kids actually went missing? Similarly, in 2014, the total number of missing children was 466,949. Very similar. In 2015, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children assisted law enforcement with more than 13,700 cases of missing children. That is, they did not touch nearly anything as far as the actual reports, right? Now, who can blame them? That is a lot of people. That is a lot of people. So there's no way an organization like that can, can adequately keep manpower and finances to tackle every instance of a missing child. I, I'm not say, speaking ill of them. But simply speaking of these numbers, we're going to see some things that they give us as far as statistics that really get scary. Okay, so they help personally with 13,700 cases according to them. Of the 13,700 that they touch, they tell us that 86% were endangered runaways. I did the math, 11,782 children. 10% family abductions, 2% lost, injured, otherwise missing, 1% non-family abductions, 1% critically missing young adults. Okay, so of the more than 11,800 endangered runaways reported to the NCMEC in 2015, they tell us that one in five were likely victims of child sex trafficking. Of those, 74% were in the care of social services when they went missing. So now I have a question. Why, how do they know they're just endangered runaways? How do they know that? I, I try to get these answers and I, I keep coming up with zilch. How do we know they're just endangered runaways? Do, do, does every kid that run away just leave a note and say, hey, I'm running away? Some of them do, you know, when they want attention. But as far as I'm concerned, from what I understand talking to people that know more about this than I do, they just disappeared. And if there's no reasonable explanation, well, there's just a teenager. We just think he ran away. You know? How do they know that? Endangered runaways. And they tell us that one in five of that 86% were likely, uh, one in five were likely victims of child sex trafficking. Well, how do they know that? How do they know that one in five? You know, I don't... It's likely. They're obviously not speaking necessarily authoritatively on the subject. So why are we guessing that one in five are taken, Right? So if you do the math on, on one in five, we're looking at like 2,300 kids that would have been sold into sex trafficking just out of the 13,700 that they talked about. I'm not even talking to the larger number that was initially given. That's over 2,300 kids. That's a lot. Now, everybody in this country knows that sex trafficking is a problem. But what I keep telling people is that you'll never get control of sex trafficking unless you target the occultic component that runs it. Because if everybody just goes after these kids that are being prostituted, they're missing the entire point. And here's what happens every time you have the secular world that gets involved chasing the criminal aspects of a Luciferian agenda. They get crushed. People die, they drop dead, they're discredited, their organizations fall apart. And why? Because they have no concept of the mystery of iniquity that's moving behind the scenes. So, this is what I did. Just, just for the sake of this presentation, I've asked myself this question. These are not numbers that I can vet. I'm speculating. I use the powers of extrapolation, extrapolation using their own statistics, and I've applied the same percentages to the larger number of missing children listed in the 2015 databases, right? So, if by chance we had the manpower to tackle all 460,699 entry reports, which obviously that doesn't adequately represent 
the exact number of children being represented in this database. What would we have found out though? Would we still have found out that 86% were endangered runaways? If that's the case, we've got 396,201 that we have no accounting for. That is a lot of kids. So many. What, we had 3,000 people die on 9-11 that rocked the nation. What if people, and this is just the missing children. I'm not even including the adults that go missing. This is insanity. These numbers should be on the, everywhere. People should be aware of how many people go missing in the United States every year. And no one asks questions. You don't hear about it either. You don't hear about it either. Jim Wilhelm sent this thing with Rob Skiba on a show one time where he talked about people that go missing in Sedona, Arizona. Right? Hiking. And they find their clothes in their backpack and all their stuff. It's like, you know, that stereotypical rapture picture where the clothes are just left on the seat. That's the way it's described. Their stuff's just in the middle of a hiking trail. They're gone. They have a, like an auction or a sale every year where they just sell stuff. I mean, I haven't vetted that. If that's true, man, that's interesting. I don't ever want to go hiking in Sedona. <laughs> I, you know, like I said, I don't know anything about I can't speak authoritatively on these, on these numbers. I'm just, I'm just guessing. I'm wondering. These are my questions. Notice question marks before I get hammered on the internet. These are question marks that I have. So I ran into this thing a long time ago. It's called the, is a report that a guy named Kenneth B. Lanning talked about. Because I've had this question. I've noticed in my, in my you know, ministry when I deal with stuff and people that I meet, like Russ and other people that I get to hang out with from time to time, you'll find that the guys in the know that do this professionally always have more to the story about murders and stuff sometimes that are on TV. There'll be crime scene reports they have access, crime scene pictures that they have access to, which show a ritual component that's only reported in the media as a murder. You have people that go missing and sold into sex trafficking that there's clearly an occultic component, but it doesn't get reported. Why? I've always wondered, why do they not report the occultic components in more of the rituals that they end up accidentally finding? They only report the murder, right? They only report the murder. You never really get an understanding or a feel for the satanic component. I've seen too many of those close up. Well, I found this interesting. In 1992, on the tail end of satanic panic, by the way, which we do not have time to go into, but this was as the organization within the FBI was doing a lot of damage to the whole occultic network. Um, they ended up pretty much getting decimated, and the network fell apart from what I understand. I know a gentleman that was involved in that, and he seems very trustworthy to me. Uh, his wisdom on the subject has been uh, valuable. And what you see is at the end of this, reports had started being written, you know, and people started to quash this notion that there was an uprising of satanic uh, ritual sacrifice in this occultic uh, element in society. Well, Kenneth E. Lanning, according to this report and on this website, he began working in the field in 1981. Allegations of ritual abuse began to surface circa 1983, the beginning of satanic panic. And at first, he tended to believe that the abuse really occurred. So we're going to find out why he changes his mind. But the number of alleged, this is his words, from what I understand, reading the report. But the number of alleged cases began to grow and grow. We now have hundreds of victims alleging that thousands of offenders are abusing and even murdering tens of thousands of people as part of organized satanic cults. And there, this is where it takes a downturn. And there is little or no corroborative evidence. The very reason many experts cite for believing these allegations, i.e. many victims who never met each other, reporting the same events, is the primary reason I began to question at least some aspects of the allegations. So at least what we have here is an admission that, hey, there are that many reports coming in that tens of thousands of people are being murdered in satanic cults. He recognizes that you can't ignore that. The reports are coming in. So what do we do with it? He gets involved. He starts, you know, and he comes to the point where he, he, he tries to dismiss it in his report. Uh, but that is the entire reason, according to his own mouth, why he started pursuing this line of research, because you couldn't ignore the amount of people that were coming forward. And he specifies people that did not know each other. Now, if you just got three people that have been best friends that come forward and they say, yeah, this happened, well, maybe not. You know, you might take it with a grain of salt. But this many people that don't know each other reporting this, well, how are we, we going to cover that up? You, you can find this anywhere you want to on the internet. It's all over the place. Lanning's Guide to Allegations of Child Ritual Abuse, Part 9. Specifically in Part 9, we find investigating multidimensional child sex rings. And the whole purpose of this is you'll see at that, that bottom line, to minimize satanic occult aspect. 
This is a special agent in the FBI that is now speaking to why we need to minimize the satanic and occult aspect when we're dealing with investigating multidimensional sex rings. There are those who claim that one of the major reasons more of the cases have not been more successfully prosecuted is that the satanic occult aspect has not been aggressively pursued. One state has even introduced legislation creating added penalties when certain crimes are committed as part of a ritual or ceremony. So we have states that recognize that ritual ceremonies take place and they add increased penalties into their penal system, right? So obviously there's some credibility that this is taking place. <clears throat> a few states have passed special ritual crime laws. I strongly disagree with such an approach. It makes no difference what spiritual belief system was used to enhance and facilitate or rationalize and justify criminal behavior. It serves no purpose to prove someone is a Satanist. So here we have the subtle mind game because these guys are so brilliant. Now we're going to acknowledge, yeah, there's some truth here, but this is why we don't have to necessarily believe it or pursue it, right? Now we're going to get some good reasons why the secular world doesn't have to care. As a matter of fact, if it is alleged that the subject committed certain criminal acts under the influence of or in order to conjure up supernatural spirits or forces, this may be very well be the basis for insanity or diminished capacity to defense or may damage the intent aspect of a sexually motivated crime. The defense may very well be more interested in all the evidence of satanic activity. Some of the satanic crime experts who train in law enforcement wind up working or testifying for these defense or for the defense in these cases. So here, no. You know, oh man, you know, if you guys can comprehend just the level of things that started to take place right now, as the world began waking up to it, right? As people became aware that this was a phenomenon taking place, here we have this massive movement begin to unfold where we're going to start covering it up, right? I got a testimony from a guy that suffered this. Carl, if you don't mind, go ahead and play the next clip. They were not teenagers dressed in black. There were maybe some in the cult, but no, they were your neighbors. They were the law enforcement officers. They were people in authority. They were the doctors down at the hospital. They were the dentist. They, they are the prominent, what you would look at as maybe prominent members of the community. But we were at a house that was way up in the hills and the, it was like they had a big fire pit set up. <laughs> there was like an altar up there and I remember they had a little boy and a little girl up there. They were tortured. They were maybe four or five years old. And they were burning them with stuff and they were they'd cut their wrists and their feet, the bottoms of their feet open and they're collecting the blood. And these kids, and so they're proving some of those kids screaming. I was up in Klatsk and I, we, we went down to the Newburg to party one time. And uh, when, I, when I was down there, uh, we, I was at a, this guy named Willie's house, apartment, his uncle Ralph's apartment, and we were all partying over there. And there's uh, the, some people that I'd never met or you know hung out with before showed up over there. And, uh, we went to this guy named Damien's house, which Damien's nickname was Six Six Six. Let's take me down to the place. <laughs> Have you been back here since? Okay, you did all right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the one guy, like, I don't even know his name, but he said that he owned the two girls that were there. And I, I thought he meant like he was their pimp or something. And he kept asking if I wanted to buy one of them. And you know, I, you know like to rent her? No, to buy it, you want to buy her. Like you can own her. And you know, I, 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 it, I I couldn't really grasp it, you know, like, how do you just buy somebody else? You know, it, it didn't make sense to me. This is the house that the dope was bought at. I sat right there for about 45 minutes waiting for Mike to come out. And he took so long 
and I was so sketched out that I took off and I made it down to about here and I saw him running down the street behind me waving his arms jumping up and down so I stopped he ran up the car got in we proceeded to go back to Willie's uncle's house well his apartment and uh, then we got there and everybody was getting high and stuff and the there was just regular like partying going on and I snorted a bunch of crank and about 15 minutes later everything started getting really weird like just like weird like it just felt weird like it was they gave me something that was not crank and I they took me over to this guy at Dennis's apartment which is only like second or third time I'd ever met this guy and there, that's when I was sitting there and I asked I was like man why are you guys doing this and he just looked me straight in the eyes and says to let to let Satan have his night of rain then Willie got mad you know like don't say that you're gonna you know mess and so then it, that's I don't remember like the next thing I really recall is that at that point when I I, the next thing I recalled was just being led back into the apartment and I it was just so weird the way you know they're like leading me like and kind of like babying me and stuff and then the, the two girls stripped me down and put me in the shower and they were washing me and I remember just I was covered from head to toe in blood and it, I, I kept asking, you know, it's like the, I'm looking down, and the water just pink, you know, just cascading down me, and I kept asking him, like, why am I bleeding? And it's, it's, don't worry, it's not your blood, it's not your. And well, whose blood? Is it? Don't worry about, it, you know. And so they got me washed up, and you know, I'm pretty much in just a. I'm pretty sure I was in shock at this point, but you know, I I I had no recollection of what had gone on, but I just had a feeling in my spirit, like. I don't even know if it was in my spirit, but I, I just knew I had to get out of there. And they put me in the bedroom, and they locked the door from the outside with a padlock on it. And uh, the window in the bedroom also had a lock on it, it was like a smaller padlock. And locked me in this bedroom right here. And then the, I, I uh, broke out of the window. I, I popped, they had a lock on it. I pulled as hard as I could, and it, I remember it just it shot up, it hit the ceiling, ricocheted over and hit the closet door, and then I could hear them fumbling, trying to get the padlock that they had on the outside of the door open, and, and I dove through the window and I ran down the alley. But I somehow made it out to the street and all the way across the vacant, you know, the whole lot that was vacant, and into a church parking lot. And I, I went to the church doors and tried to get in. And, you know, it was locked up, which is, you know, five, four or five in the morning. Uh, and it was early Sunday mornings. It, it's the, what I will explain here in a little bit, happened uh, Saturday night. And uh, so uh, I, I, there was a, a van parked in the parking lot there. I had I had to hide. I knew I had to hide because I was running from him, and I I jammed my fingers up under here, which I I have no idea how I did it, and I just pulled, and the window shattered, and then I, I just crawled through the window. I said that was early Sunday morning, and you know everybody shows up to go to church the next day, and I, I believe the pastor showed up for anybody else and saw the broken window, so we called the police, and they came to you know. I, I woke up to the police outside the van, you're like, you know, well, it looks like they're trying to steal parts, and, you know, so, at which point I sat up in the front seat and uh, was promptly arrested. And so, when I was being taken to jail, I guess, it was my friend Bubba's cousin, Mark, that was the arresting officer, and he said that, I kept babbling about dead kids and I didn't at, at that point 
I didn't really have any recollection. I uh, got out of jail and I went and got my car and it was a couple of days that everything started kind of coming back to me. And I, I thought I was crazy for a long time because, you know, it's, that's not normal stuff that happened to someone. It just like hit me like a wave and I, I, I remembered what had been done, you know, and I, I'd been taken to, I, I, I don't know where we were at. I don't know how we got there, but I remember there was a very pretty good sized group of people, I'd say between 30 and 50 people that were there. And the place that we're at was, you, you could tell just, it was one of the regular spots, you know, the, just the way that the grounds were kept and the the whole setup of it, you know, like they had a, a big fire pit down below and then there's like two sets of stairways like that went up on the sides and then they had a big altar up there. And they had a little boy, a little girl chained down the altar and they were torturing them, and they, I mean, they'd stab them. I remember they were cutting the bottoms of their feet open, and just the, the noises that these kids made, and the smell, and like, I'll, I'll never forget that, you know, and just the, the torment, and the, the torture they put these kids through, and... You've talked with, you know, a lot of people that have been through stuff like this, like, how do most people, like, cope with this stuff, you know? Um, I mean, because I, I kept this inside for years, you know, I think, until I came back to Ohio and told you guys about it. I think it only told, like, maybe four people in my life, you know, because I was so ashamed of it, you know. Like, I was so ashamed that I didn't do anything to help those kids. But, you know, how? What, what do you do? A lot of people split. A lot of people become drug addicts. A lot of people commit suicide. A lot of people, they do a lot of things. A lot of people don't get help because there's not enough help. finally stabbed them through the heart and then they cut their throats and bled them out and disemboweled them and whatnot. And then uh, after that, they, uh, they took the kids off and they were eating parts of them and drinking their blood and stuff. And then they, uh, they took me down in a, like a basement room and they had the two little kids uh, laying on like a table deal and they were laying there just, you know, just looking all grotesque and they told me, you know, like, if you ever tell anybody about this, this is what your family's going to look like. And then they, they, I remember I was in just a big circle of people and I was crawling around on my hands and knees and, you know, I was naked and they, they were raping me and they were being urinating on me and throwing feces on me and I was covered in blood and I just remember crawling around just begging them to stop and please, you know, and just, they just kept going, you know, and then the next thing I know is they're leading me back into Willie's uncle's apartment and then, and then they put me in the shower, you know, but it just, you know, I, I, I don't know where we were. You know, I just know that that night, you know, pretty much ruined my life for a long time. I don't know, you can make up your own mind. Does it sound like a guy that's just making something up? And even if it was just one guy saying that, yeah, maybe. But we have tens of thousands of testimonies that are very similar to this. So because the secular world tells me, yeah, he got drunk one night, he might have had some form of trauma. 
He just filled in all the satanic components. Why are we always filling in these traumas with just satanic components? Why don't I just have a manufactured memory that I hit a deer and I laid out in the woods and got eaten alive by mosquitoes? That would sound to me pretty traumatic. Why don't people ever... Why is it always fires, bonfires, children dying, daggers, blood? Why? Because I submit to you that it's been going on for a long time. And that what's happening in this country today is what was happening in the world 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 years ago. There's no new thing under the sun. This is not new. The only thing I can speak to authoritatively is the modern aspects of it and what we're seeing today in my lifetime. And I'll tell you, there's enough evidence in Scripture and there's enough evidence of what we deal with today that this is a real thing that is happening to real people and it is really traumatizing. And if the church doesn't wake up, if the church doesn't wake up, who else is going to wake up to help these people? I, I'm not submitting to you that everybody in the church needs to get out and start working in this ministry. I highly recommend you don't. God will call people. He will equip people for this ministry that he has set aside. You should never get involved in the deliverance ministry or working with satanic ritual abuse survivors unless God has specifically placed you there. If I had my choice, I wouldn't do it. The only reason I do it is because I'm called to it. And when you're called, you don't have a choice, and I've been equipped to do it, and I will do it until the day I die. I seek to finish this race and receive my crown of glory, and no matter how much trash we have to listen to, how, how, how much pain and hurt that we have to deal with in this world, I know that God has promised to make me eternally happy. And so all of the evils that we deal with for a time, they pale in comparison, right? What Paul talked about to the glory that will be revealed inside, right? I know there's a day coming when all of this is gone. I don't have to reconcile why it's allowed. I just know it is, and I know I'm called to help, right? And all I ask of the church is that the church does not listen to the advice of the secular world that this is not something that's taking place. I just ask that the church begins to pray against the powers and principalities that sit in the high places in places of rulership over us. And the more we pray against the powers and principalities, we can usher in the Holy Spirit and his entire administration that he's orchestrated in Scripture, and we can have something beautiful again. I am praying for another revival like the one that took place under the tutelage of Jonathan Edwards in Enfield, Connecticut in 1741. I am praying for another great awakening. I want people to wake up and just pray the Holy Spirit down on this country. I want to see the light shine all into every dark place. And I want this occultic movement uprooted and dismantled and destroyed. And I don't know that I'll ever get to see that. But I know I will try till the day I die to bring awareness to it. That is what we're doing with this movie. I don't want to end on a down note. We win in the end. This isn't something that they have authority over God. God's not under the foot of this. I don't want it to sound like that. But when Christians fail to uphold their responsibility to do what we're supposed to do, this is what happens. And this is a direct result of the church not acting like the church. Largely in part, I don't believe that most of the people that call themselves Christians are Christians. The more we evangelize, bring people to salvation, and expose the unfruitful works of darkness like Ephesians 5 tells us, the faster we can resolve this kind of crap. Until then, pray for these people every day. Pray that it's exposed. And when someone comes and may tell you a story, don't dismiss it because it sounds crazy. Sometimes all it takes is a conversation and listening to that person for them to already start to, you know, hey, you'd be amazed, man. I, we, don't, we don't have all the answers when we do deliverance. I walk into most, most deliverance sessions blind, on fire, backwards, upside down, whatever. I have no idea what's going on in that person's life. I have no idea where they came from. But my mentality is always this. I do not know all the answers, but I know the one who does. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be an intercessor for that person and a vehicle that the Holy Spirit can use to reach this person. Because I know I'm not the person reaching that person. It's not my authority that's freeing that person in a deliverance encounter. It's Christ. I'm just there to represent him and to allow him to work through me. And you guys can do that too. You sit down with somebody, you talk about this stuff, you let Christ work through you. That's how this really works, is not us, but Christ working through us. So, I submit to you that I believe this is a reality. I believe the church is inept, not praying, and engaging in spiritual warfare the way that it should.
Go check out the movie. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.